Yes, done to 8 p.m. yesterday. Another bumper day. Thank you for everybody who's come forward to get tested. Uh, we had unfortunately 390 cases of community transmission. Uh, some are still under investigation, but at least 60 of those have been infectious in the community. And I anticipate, given the large number of cases we've had in the last few days, that unfortunately this trend will continue for at least the next few days. So it means all of us have to work harder to make sure we stay at home and follow the rules. Tragically, two people lost their lives um, overnight uh, because of COVID. Uh, one woman in her 40s in southwestern Sydney who died at home tragically. She wasn't vaccinated and we extend our heartfelt condolences to her loved ones and extended family. There was also the tragic death of a man in his late 90s in the Hunter, New England area. Uh, he was vaccinated but also under palliative care. Uh, again, our heartfelt sympathies and condolences. I know that every day when we read the statistics, statistics about the deaths, um, we often remember or don't remember that behind every single statistic is a loved one, a family uh, and many carers. So we extend our heartfelt thoughts to all of them. Uh, the main challenges remain Western Sydney and South Western Sydney. And whilst again, we've seen an ongoing stabilisation in Fairfield and Canterbury Bankstown, Canterbury Bankstown still has the highest number of cases, but we have seen stabilisation and the cases aren't growing the way they were uh, in the last few weeks, which is a positive. Uh, but the health experts have asked me to highlight Blacktown and Mount Druid as areas of, of concern and adjoining areas. So we're really wanting to make sure that people living in Blacktown and Mount Druid and those adjoining suburbs uh, come forward for testing, stay home. Uh, and if they haven't already got vaccinated and they don't have symptoms to come forward and get vaccinated. Uh, unfortunately, also around the Dubbo region, uh, Dubbo in Western New South Wales is uh, becoming a big challenge health wise with 25 cases overnight. Uh, and of course, um, the New South Wales government has been liaising with our federal colleagues as well to make sure we get support to those uh, communities in Western New South Wales and far Western New South Wales. And uh, anything we um, may, may need to do further in that area is being considered uh, during the day to day. Uh, Hunter, New England had five additional cases, which is an improvement of the, of the last few days. Uh, however, pleasingly, Tamworth, Armidale and Northern Rivers um, had no cases, uh, which is pleasing. However, obviously, um, we're not out of the woods in those areas, given there were those uh, exposure sites. In relation to vaccines, thank you to the 105,000 people who got jabbed yesterday. That's an outstanding result. Uh, pleasingly, by the end of today, 15,000 HSE students would have received the jab. So um, again, a very pleasing result. In five days, we've done 15,000 HSE students. Uh, and I want to thank them all for coming forward and getting the jab. Uh, it means they can sit safely for their examinations later in the year. Uh, this Sunday, we have a bumper day of vaccinations for tradies and construction workers. Uh, there's already around 10,000 people who've booked uh, throughout um, those locations. And I just want to stress that the one location in Prairie Wood will maintain its status as a walk-in centre. So if you're a tradie or a construction worker, you haven't already got a jab and you haven't booked anywhere or won't be booking by that day, you can walk into the Prairie Wood Centre and get the jab as well. And that's pleasing that the construction sector and traders have been very enthusiastic about coming forward and getting the jab. And certainly getting back to work uh, safely has been an incentive for that uh, group of workers. Uh, pleasingly, from Monday next week, 100,000 authorised workers aged between 16 and 39 years of age in those local area governments of concern in Greater Sydney will be getting a jab. So uh, their workplaces, through their workplaces and through other points of contact, they'll be sent invitations. Um, so over and above uh, what we're doing already, 100,000 um, uh, authorised workers. And we know that workplaces and households remain and continue to be the greatest source of infection. We know there's categories of workers that just can't stay at home because of the important work they do, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in getting food on our table, they must work. And knowing that they're going to get vaccinated gives us that greater degree of confidence uh, in trying to reduce the spread, but also in making sure people stay out of hospital. And that's what we need to ensure. Uh, please know that by following the rules and getting vaccinated, you are making sure that you keep yourself and your loved ones safe. And it's really, really important that if you haven't had the vaccine, please consider uh, getting it to make sure that you stay safe, you stay out of hospital, but also that we do everything we can to reduce uh, the spread. I also wanted to highlight to the community, um, given National Cabinet's meeting today, 
that uh, according to the Doherty report, which the New South Wales government supports, uh, once you get to 70% double doses, it triggers certain conditions. And of course, once you get to 80% of your adult population on double doses, that means uh, obviously uh, that communities start to live with COVID in a real a meaningful way. So on current projections, conservatively, New South Wales will get to 70% um, double doses by the end of October. And by mid-November, we hope to get to 80% double doses. And of course, um, I'm looking forward to those 6 million jabs occurring by the end of August. And so far, we're doing very well. I think we're up to 4.7 million or 4.8 million by the end of today in terms of jabs. Hopefully, we'll get to 5 million early next week and then uh, the sprint towards 6 million by the end of August. And we're looking forward to hitting those milestones because we know the more of us, the higher percentage of us that are vaccinated, the greater opportunities we have in the future and the greater opportunities we have um, to live more freely and safely. Uh, so uh, I'll now ask uh, Dr. Marianne Gale to give the health update. Deputy Commissioner Willing will talk about some police operations and then we'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Premier, and good morning, everyone. There were 390 locally acquired cases of COVID-19 reported in New South Wales to the 8 to 8 p.m. last night, and one overseas case. There were uh, almost 130,000 tests reported to 8 p.m. last night. Um, so again, a big thank you to all the community for coming out to get tested, um, and again, um, an all important reminder that even with the mildest of symptoms, uh, we ask you to please come forward uh, to get tested and continue to do so um, in the great numbers that, that you are. In terms of COVID-19 cases in hospital, there are currently 391 uh, cases admitted to hospital, 63 cases are in intensive care and 30 require ventilation. Of the 63 in ICU, four are in their 20s, six are in their 30s, five in their 40s, and 15 are in their 50s. And I just want to emphasize, I guess again to people, the importance, particularly for young people in our community. Um, with this Delta variant, we are seeing a large number of younger adults uh, being affected by COVID-19. Um, in the last 14 days, that 20 to 29 year old age group we have seen being the biggest um, numbers and so I just want to particularly uh, encourage younger adults in our community to please um, take the stay at home orders in um, the Greater Sydney area um, you know as seriously as you as you possibly can uh, please follow the advice please get tested please get vaccinated of the 63 people who are in ICU uh, 55 are not vaccinated. As the Premier mentioned, we're very sad uh, to, to be notified that two cases of COVID um, di uh, diagnosed um, died uh, overnight. The first is a man in his late 90s from Newcastle who died at Hawkins Masonic Village in Edgeworth. Um, he had acquired his infection recently as part of the outbreak in the facility. Um, he had received two doses uh, of vaccine and our heartfelt um, sympathies go out uh, to that family uh, at this time. The second death notified was a woman in her 40s who died at home in southwestern Sydney. She was a close contact of another confirmed case. She tested positive on August 7th and was unvaccinated and the uh, local health district uh, will be investigating um, her death and, um, and also be referring it to the coroner. And again, um, our sincere heartfelt condolences uh, to her family. I'd like to provide a brief update on Western New South Wales. Um, overnight, we had 10 new cases identified in the Western New South Wales local health district, um, the majority being in Dubbo and two um, sorry, in Walgett. Um, it is an evolving situation in Western New South Wales um, that we are uh, carefully monitoring and um, we do expect to see um, some further cases emerge. Um, in the sewage detection, uh, there has been COVID-19 detected in the Bathurst region, Parks and Burke. Um, and so we encourage all the community in Western New South Wales um, to please 
note the stay at home orders, um, stay within your household, um, don't go out only for reasonable excuses, please seek testing um, and please get vaccinated um, as soon as you have an opportunity to do so. In Hunter, New England, there were five cases uh, notified overnight. One is an additional case associated with the residential aged care facility um, and the four other cases are those linked to previously reported cases. Um, and finally, um, just to emphasise, as the Premier did earlier, um, we'd like to encourage uh, people who live uh, in the Blacktown area um, and Mount Druitt area as well to please uh, follow the stay at home order um, and please come forward for testing uh, if you have even the mildest of symptoms. Thank you. Good morning, Premier, Minister. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In the last 24 hours, 404 infringement notices have been issued and 41 people charged with breaches of the public health order. It's simply unbelievable at this point in the current crisis that people are still flouting the rules. I can indicate that, well, as you're aware, yesterday a 19-year-old Rose Bay man was charged with breaching the public health order by travelling to the Byron Bay area. A 52-year-old man remains before the courts in relation to the same matters. I can indicate this morning that overnight a 21-year-old female and a 20-year-old female were charged with breaching the public health orders by travelling to the Newcastle area around two weeks ago. Police will be alleging that both of those women have a history of non-compliance with the public health orders. And I've got to say that people travelling to regional areas from Greater Sydney are putting regional communities at risk. If we don't catch you during our compliance operations, which is highly likely given uh, the, the amount of resources that are out there on our roads and in our communities trying to find people in breach of public health orders, we will, so, we will do so through our investigations. Um, just overnight, police responded to 1,100 odd Crime Stoppers reports. All of those spark investigations. Now in saying that, um, I'd like to thank the people who are abiding by the current health orders. In the last 24 hours alone, police have conducted over 1,800 welfare compliance checks, checking on over 3,000 people. And the advice that I've received this morning is that all of those people were in compliance with the public health orders. So thank you to those people. And I just want to reiterate too that uh, emergency management arrangements in the form of, of local emergency management committees and regional emergency management committees are up and running across the state of New South Wales to support people through this difficult period. In regional New South Wales, particularly in the far west of the state, those arrangements include specific action plans that have been developed with input from local communities and tailored to local communities out there to help them through this current difficult period. So thank you very much. That's right, yes. Yeah. So the numbers I was giving was till 8pm last night. Um, the Premier's right and hence I mentioned it is an evolving situation in the, in the district. Um, we are seeing some further cases come through. Um, so yes, there will be, um, uh, there's around uh, 22 uh, cases currently in Western New South Wales, um, but the figures I gave were to 8pm last night. Um, that's right, and so we are concerned about Western New South Wales and why we're asking um, the uh, residents of Western New South Wales and those LGAs that have been named as where stay-at-home orders are in place um, to really uh, follow the public health advice, do stay home, um, don't have visitors to your household, only leave your household if you have a reasonable excuse, and please come forward for testing if you have the mildest of symptoms. Um, so there are considerable efforts going on locally um, uh, from New South Wales Health and partners including the federal government um, to support the response in Western New South Wales. Um, we're particularly aware that we see a, a large proportion of the population in that part of New South Wales um, being Aboriginal uh, communities and we're particularly conscious of being able to best support um, our Aboriginal communities um, during this time. Um, look, I'm not going to provide the overall breakdown, but certainly some of the cases are Aboriginal people. 
um, and we're conscious that in those um, in that part of the state, um, many of our Aboriginal communities uh, often come from large families, do move around as part of you know cultural practice, and so um, hence our advice um, for that area to please um, follow the health advice, stay home, stay within your household, only leave if you have a reasonable excuse. And as I said, operationally we're putting. Um, many supports in place to um, best support our Aboriginal community in particular during this time. Thank you. Oh, look, it's really important that uh, we're dealing with a strain of COVID, the Delta variant, uh, which is really untested in this magnitude in Australia. And uh, we need to make sure we're flexible and adapt as the disease and the virus moves through our communities. And uh, we have learned a lot in the last few weeks. And I think it's important, as I've said from day one, that if there are evolving situations, if there are updates to the health advice, we need to take that on board. We need to make sure we consider it. Yeah, in relation to, in relation to um, the police advice, um, as I said, uh, the police commissioner and, and the deputy commissioners, deputy commissioner Warboys, deputy commissioner Willing have been on the ground and can I thank them for setting up the emergency management committees in those local government areas of concern, including in Western New South Wales. The police have been outstanding throughout this process in make, making sure they're standing up a whole of government response whenever there's a local government area of concern, whether it's in Greater Sydney or whether it's in our regions. And this means bringing together and wrapping around whole of government services, um, whether it's compliance activity, whether it's obviously the health services, but also social services uh, in very, um, in some very challenging communities in part. So it's really important to make sure those processes, those extra compliance measures continue. And if there's more we need to do, uh, we obviously will be considering uh, advice uh, from police in relation to additional measures as well. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Uh, please know that we're pouring so many additional resources into those communities that are experiencing the higher case numbers. It was very pleasing to me that HSC students were offered vaccines this week, 15,000 of them. 100,000 16 to 39 year olds will be offered vaccine in those local government areas of concern from Monday next week. An opportunity I know that many other people would like in that age group to get the vaccine. Uh, and of course, we're also making sure that we have the additional pop-up clinics, the additional social services. So please know we're doing everything we can to support communities going through that difficult time. But we do also know that we're all connected. We do also know that uh, when one part of our great state is going through a particularly difficult time, it impacts on all of us. And, uh, and we can't afford setbacks, but we also can't afford to leave communities behind, quite the contrary. We're working, we're working very hard to make sure we put resources in those areas that are needed. And that's why those extra 100,000 vaccines to authorise workers gives me a degree of comfort because it's very targeted. It's targeted to those young people that are still having to move around from those communities because of their jobs. And it goes specifically to workplaces. And I want to thank uh, various industry leads, industry heads who've worked with us to target those categories of workers who will be getting uh, the 100,000 jabs, the, the young ones, the 16 to 39 year olds, who we know uh, in this outbreak uh, are as susceptible to Delta, but also uh, unfortunately because of their jobs, are then potentially taking that home to their large extended families. And if we get to them next week, uh, we think that will have a positive impact in reducing the spread, but also importantly, and again, I know it's horrible every time you talk about a death, um, but that is what we need to prevent. We need to prevent people ending up in hospital and we need to prevent people dying. And that's why vaccines will help. Stopping the spread obviously helps, but um, I'm not gonna shy away from the fact that increasing case numbers is a horrible situation and not one we want to be in. But please be reassured that our absolute commitment is to reduce those case numbers whilst we're increasing the vaccination rate. Clinton was next. Clinton, Clinton. Sorry, so excuse me, I'm sorry, can you just, Wait your turn, Clinton. Yep. Regarding Canberra, but the regions as well, given the close proximity to the south coast, Queensland, those areas, are you looking to put those areas in lockdown? 
Well, look, I, it is an evolving situation, so we look at the health advice, and I know that people are concerned about various movements that have occurred overnight from the ACT to parts of our south coast, and we have had concerns from community leaders about that today. So um, the, the, health, the health team has advised the minister and myself that they're looking at those issues today. It's an evolving situation, and if we need to do anything as a preemptive move, we will, similar to what we've done in other parts of the state, we will. Uh, but no doubt, what is really critical is in a pandemic, you can't just say these this is what we're doing today and, and just stand still when things change when things move very quickly you have to adapt and move as well and that's exactly what we're doing Look, it's pretty obvious to us and pretty obvious from the feedback we get from police that uh, people use the health orders as an excuse or to do the wrong thing. So people are saying, oh, I didn't know this was this or this was that. Most of the time that's not true. Most of the time people are knowingly, can I make this very clear? Police are doing an incredible job uh, in terms of compliance. But let's not pretend that people are doing the right thing. People are knowingly doing the wrong thing and pretending it's because they didn't understand. Now, we've been very clear about what the rules are. Stay at home unless you absolutely uh, have to leave your house because of authorised work. And make sure if you have symptoms, you don't leave the house, you get tested and stay home and isolate. And of course, come forward and get vaccinated. People know the basic rules. Unfortunately, again, can I acknowledge, and this is really important, because if you go to some of those local government areas of concern in Western Sydney and South Western Sydney, I get updates from Deputy Commissioner Warboys and, and Willing all the time. Some streets are absolutely bare. There is nobody around. The vast majority of people are doing the right thing. But when a handful don't, it is a setback for all of us. For example, there was one, one person who knowingly did the wrong thing and has caused havoc in about seven or eight local government areas in Western New South Wales. Now, this just demonstrates Delta does not leave any room for error. Delta does not leave any room for it, even one or two people doing the wrong thing. I want to stress that the vast majority of people are really trying to do everything as best they can, but it's a handful that use the health orders as an excuse when in fact they know they're doing the wrong thing. And um, I don't know if Deputy Commissioner Willing has an update on that situation in Byron Bay, for example, when people knowingly do the wrong thing and pretend they didn't know, that's not acceptable. So I'm a, a bit tired of hearing people saying they don't know uh, what they're supposed to do. It's really people knowingly having disregard, unfortunately, for their loved ones and also the rest of us in breaching uh, the health orders. Sorry, sorry, we'll just get, sorry, we'll just give everybody a turn, yep. Yeah. Extra yeah. The I might ask um, uh, Health Minister Hazard to comment on that, but um, I can say at the outset that we've been advised extra Pfizer jabs will be arriving uh, to Western New South Wales, and I might ask Dr Hazard as he's been in touch with his um, counterparts. Uh, thanks, Anne. Look, um, obviously there is a big challenge in northwestern New South Wales because the townships and towns that we're talking about are principally places, uh, for example, like Walgett. Walgett probably has about uh, three and a half thousand people generally in town. In the broad area, there'd be about maybe six and a half, six thousand. Um, and obviously, the uh, the medical facilities are much smaller than you'd expect to find in a major city like Sydney. Um, there is. Uh, there's an Aboriginal medical service there which does excellent work. It's a very large uh, building and, uh, and a, a reasonable number of staff, but uh, they manage in normal times, but uh, trying to manage if there is a major outbreak of something that is a one in 100 year virus is certainly going to be a challenge for them. 
So uh, the night before last, I wrote to uh, uh, Minister Hunt um, and uh, just pointed out that uh, uh, the Aboriginal community, of course, I should go back a step, a step, one step and just say that in Walgett, the Aboriginal community probably makes up about 80% of the community, give or take. Um, and I pointed out to uh, him on, on behalf of the state government that we would need them to step in and do the work that uh, they said they would be doing much, much earlier, uh, and that is to, uh, to try and vaccinate as many people as possible and provide support. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, that the federal government has been under massive pressure because of the, the, the desire to get as much vaccine into the country as possible, but the whole world is chasing vaccine. And uh, but they have stepped up. Uh, Minister Hunt responded uh, uh, quite quickly. I think it was within an hour or two. Um, he responded uh, to me and indicated that uh, uh, they would have the appropriate uh, committees put in place to get the ADF working with the uh, uh, Public Health Network up there and with the Western, Sydney, uh, Western New South Wales Local Health District. Um, at this stage, they've offered, uh, in fact, may have already delivered by now. I haven't managed to update this morning, but they were getting vaccines up there as quickly as possible. They were getting about 8,000 vaccines to add to the vaccines that uh, New South Wales was already sending up to Walgett. Uh, but is it a serious uh, issue for the local community? Yes, it is, very much so, because uh, uh, the ICU in a, hospital, in a place like that is nowhere near what we would expect in Sydney. So that's why uh, the, uh, the entire uh, New South Wales Health Service is on high alert uh, and is asking the community up there to definitely stick at home, stay at home. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, in the broader community, there's uh, there's uh, a propens a, a more likely uh, circumstance would be to see family members moving between households. Our big effort uh, this morning is to try and get that message through to locals that uh, stick just in your own household right at the moment. Some of the households are quite large households, which presents issues because you might have one person go in, but there could be 10 or 12 people living in that household and you could instantly have 10 or 12 more people positive. So we're doing what we can. Um, as I speak, I know that the committees are meeting with the federal government, our state uh, committees and uh, incident committees that uh, the Deputy Commissioner Willing talked about earlier to try and uh, work out what staff might be available on the ground. At this point, I can't give you a clear indication of what federal staff would be available, but they're also under pressure. Um, so I, I would just say this, that uh, the, the basic message to the community is this is one that the community really do have to take some responsibility and make sure you stay at home, listen to the messages, don't go out unless you absolutely crucial. You have to for the vital reasons that uh, um, are, are well known now. So only if you can't work from home or only if you need to go out for health reasons essentially and limited amounts of exercise if you can do that and stick to only one other person if you go out uh, in terms of a walk but basically stay at home. Yeah. Evans, um, sorry, could I, could I go to Lucy first, sorry? Mm. I'm sorry, Lucy, say that again. Oh. When you say good enough, that's, that's it's a loaded question in the sense of, uh, are we seeking to blame somebody? I'll just say this, that there's a shortage of vaccines across the world um, and until the last uh, few weeks there's been, I mean every day I come here and every day I, in, when I arrive at the office there's texts and emails asking for uh, vaccines to go to different sections of the community and they sometimes would prefer one vaccine over another. Uh, I think there's been a challenge that is obvious to everybody um, and uh, we would have all liked far more vaccine to have been in those uh, more remote communities because it was identified last year that uh, there were some risks in our state, particularly in those areas. In other states, I've spoken to the health ministers there, they have had uh, um, the same issues. So I think uh, it's not a case of uh, blaming anybody, it's just recognising that there have been other priorities. And uh, now the federal government are obviously trying to assist us, or we're trying to assist them, I should say, in, in a sense of doing what was their obligation, and that is making sure, hang on, making sure that we try and get those vaccines up there and into arms. Um, Sorry, should I go Sarah first and then you? Is that right? Uh, that's not been proposed to me by the health officials at any point. No, as I said yesterday, we've tried to balance all the way along through this, uh, keeping our economy open, trying to address mental health. Uh, I'm sure each of you would be knowing people now who are really struggling with uh, mental health issues. And uh, let's face it, it's a pretty awful time. 
So we're still trying to strike that balance here in New South Wales, and making sure that people do that. Right. But no, no, no intention to do that at this point. So I'll just finish with Sarah and I'll come back. Sorry? As I said yesterday, Sarah, the, the advice from our public health team has been not just the affected community, but an affected community, yes, but where we think that it might be, where the virus might be moving into. And that's sometimes because of uh, uh, cultural associations in, in families that might be in another area. Um, so, for example, that's what drove our decision making, uh, to some extent anyway, or to a large extent actually, in the, uh, in the suburbs in the Penrith and the Pean area that were just across from Blacktown. So our public health team identifies to us that uh, there are cultural connections and families that have relatives and others that move back and forth. So those sorts of issues. So it's, it's not just where it's affected, where it might be affected. Sorry, yes. Yeah, Mr Hazard, there's been an outbreak of a giant death uh, school in Gladesville, Gladesville yeah. which um, yeah. caters to children with severe autism. Yes. Um, I'm going to have to ask uh, Dr Gale, but can I just say that that's been one of our real concerns, um, that people with uh, disabilities um, and their families and, and uh, teachers have been exposed. And again, that's something the federal government's been trying to address because obviously people with disabilities are one of the groups that they identified early on that was their responsibility and that we would try to help them with. But it hasn't been possible to get to all of the various facilities. But we're still doing what we can to try and back them in and give them the support they need. Um, Dr. Gale, do you have any more information on that particular school at the stage, or not? Can we take that one on notice and get back to you? Because Dr. Gale doesn't have that information Can you give us, um, some of these families are saying it's really hard a to get their kids vaccinated or tested because of their disability. Can you give us an update on that? Because it's really hard to get Um, <clears throat> again, the federal government was leading that, but I, I have actually talked about this before, that, um, for example, uh, when we established the hub at Sydney Olympic Park, um, I made it very clear publicly that uh, if, uh, if family, or go back a step, where, it depends where, the, where the people with disabilities are living, but in the, I think it's 2,260 roughly group homes across the state, um, there was uh, um, a need for the federal government to address that issue, but they, obviously it's challenging because each each home would only have uh, four or five people maximum and the staff. Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of people who, as you're identifying, still living at home, particularly school students. Federal government's responsibility was to get that out, but we're trying to back them in. And what we did, what we announced um, when we established the Sydney hub, the vaccination hub, was that if families could bring their their um, their uh, family members with disabilities to the hub, then we would make sure they were vaccinated. But I think there's, there's still a long way to go, and that's certainly part of the, the issue now. Minister, yes. The been more about people doing the wrong thing. I'm sorry, just very quiet. The government's been talking more about people knowing they're doing the wrong yes. thing. Can you give us some idea of the proportion of cases that are from non-compliance and those that are transmitted from Very difficult to say that, but I think it's fair to say that. You heard the Premier's frustration and the Deputy Commissioner's. Um, there are people, go back to the good part, there are, the majority of our community are doing an amazing job. Uh, we've seen how the people in Fairfield, for example, listen to the messages and the, the numbers of positive cases, uh, new positive cases in Fairfield have come down dramatically. Um, what we need though is more people to listen to those messages but what is really frustrating, I think, for the entire public health team, our nurses and doctors who are at the front line, is when they have cases that are positive, where they know those people have just defied the orders, thumbed their nose at the rest of the community, thumbed their nose at the orders, thumbed their nose at the families that are actually suffering because of what they're doing. That is really frustrating. And I think that, uh, you know, there's, uh, if you look at what's happening in the United States at the moment, there are thousands more people now becoming positive uh, many hundreds more dying when they thought they were doing well. Delta is an extremely dangerous weapon and some people are allowing it to be used as a weapon because of their ignorance, their stupidity and their desire just to thumb their nose at the, uh, the health orders 
and the law generally and the community. Uh, I think uh, we all need to make sure those people know that uh, they need to step up and start behaving like they're a part of the broader Australian community. Uh, yes. Look, I think one of the good things, one of the great things actually that's happening at Kudos, first of all, thank you to all the students who've come forward. I think about 15,000 have been booked in. But the uh, health team out there, I'm not sure it was made public, but we have been not only vaccinating those young people, but also testing them straight after they've been, um, they've been vaccinated. So if we think about the fact that uh, we've had 15,000 young people go through there and only one has been positive, uh, that's in, uh, a wonderful indicator that the uh, local community in that area, particularly through the younger people, um, are doing very well. So it's actually very positive. And I think the health team there felt very positive about the fact that there was only one case. With regard to the mm. guidance, Sorry, um, Clinton. Um, look, um, <coughs> the, the health team have actually made clear that whilst we're focusing on certain areas to drive the enthusiasm for it, we'll still be coming back to those other areas as, as more fires are coming on board. So that's not a major concern. But uh, I want to thank the 15,000 students who did come forward. They and, and, yesterday. Sorry, Clinton, can I just finish? And can I say, everybody who gets vaccinated, everybody, becomes an ambassador for vaccination. I know I've said this once, I think, before, that the day after I had my second AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, I walked outside and everything seemed a lot brighter. The sun was shining much nicer. So I've got to say, I think we all need to just realise that as we get each person vaccinated, they are ambassadors for vaccination and they drive back against those who, uh, who uh, are perhaps uh, uh, ignorant of the understanding of what vaccines can do for, the, for us and the world. Liz. Not me. I'll just finish me and then I can go back. Is that right? It was... Nobody else is good? Great. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gale. Can we just get some more information about the um, tragic death of the woman in her 40s? Is that in Cabramatta? And um, obviously she was at home. Had she decided that she was going to go to hospital or did she deteriorate quite rapidly? Look, at, at this point, um, the, the tragic case um, of that lady's death is being investigated by the local health district. Um, what we do know uh, is that the health services were in contact with the family um, in the days um, preceding her tragic death. Um, but as I said earlier, um, all of those issues are being looked into um, by the district to understand what happened. Um, and it's also will be referred to the coroner. Yeah, look, thank you for that question. Um, that's a great question and certainly um, we are concerned about the number of younger people, um, as I mentioned earlier, affected um, during this Delta outbreak. And certainly we look very closely um, at the infection rates in children. Um, and our, I know that our children's hospital network, um, you know, have a, have a large number of children who, are, who they are um, supporting in the community and for those children who need hospitalisation, you know, taking very good care of them in hospital. Um, but clearly we are seeing more children um, being infected with COVID um, this year compared to what we were seeing last year. And certainly we're discussing those issues with the Department of Education um, and others uh, industries that look after children as to, you know, what are the right um, measures and, and settings because, um, you know, we are seeing uh, children, more children with COVID. And so that's absolutely something that we monitor very closely I'm going to consulting with experts about.
Look, I think what is realistic is what the Doherty report sets out in terms of how we live life freely. And the Doherty report clearly says, as National Cabinet has signed off on, that you need 70% of double dose uh, and 80% of double dose before you can start considering living with COVID in a much freer way. However, what I have said is obviously we're looking at opportunities uh, in September and October if there's a way for us uh, to look at incentives. Uh, and I want to make this point. I know that many assumed the construction sector and traders would balk at the suggestion of getting vaccinated. The enthusiasm we've had from people to get vaccinated to be able to go back to work has been a very strong indication of the type of policy settings we might follow in the future. Uh, the fact that so many have come forward already, we're putting on at least, I think 8,000 people have already booked to come in our Super Sunday vaccination already. We're expecting eight to 10,000 people to get vaccinated just on the Sunday alone. And we know that with the extra 100,000 authorised workers between the age of 16 and 39 coming forward next week, that there's a high demand for people who want to get vaccinated. Uh, but I will say this, that uh, I appreciate because of the work that was done with the construction sector that other industries are now saying, well, what does that mean for us? And they've approached government and we're happy to hear people and hear what proposals they have to put forward. But I want to make very clear um, that uh, what we want to, do, to achieve in September and October is uh, provide some uh, opportunities for people to have an extra thing that they can do, which they currently can't do today. But I don't want to give the impression that it's going to be freedom all round. It's not going to be freedom all round until it's 70% double doses uh, at least, and then 80% is when we learn to live with COVID. But having said that, I think all of us have to come to terms with what living with COVID means. Once you get 80% double doses, it essentially means whoever isn't vaccinated and whoever chooses not to be vaccinated by that point, but because by that point, everybody will have had the opportunity to be offered the vaccine. Um, living with COVID is very different to what we're doing now at the moment. We're trying to get the case numbers down as much as we can, uh, trying to make sure that the case numbers don't uh, accelerate exponentially. And it's very, very concerning when you see the case numbers going up. But I want to make very clear that um, the Doherty report says you have to get to 70% double doses before you can really start living freely. And then 80% uh, double dose before you can actually live with COVID. Uh, and we support that. However, what we need to do and what will be the most, I think, the most challenging time for our state is how do we live safely through September and October? And in those areas where there's high vaccination rates and lower number of cases, what can, incentives can we provide people to make sure uh, that they can do at least something extra they can't do now? So that's always uh, what, our, uh, what our aim has been. And that's why I'm really keen to get to those 6 million jabs because it does give us a few options in terms of pilots, in terms of looking at industries, looking at classes of workers that can come back because we've seen that uh, workers are enthusiastically embracing getting vaccination if it means getting back to work. And we know that vaccination reduces your chance of spreading the virus, but also staying out of hospital. And at this stage, can I just, before I answer the next question, just make this point. Please, if you are worried about the health and well-being of your loved ones, please encourage them to get vaccinated. I know some people have experienced frustration in getting uh, the vaccine, but now for younger people in those authorised worker categories, uh, we have 100,000 doses that are being brought forward next week for them to get vaccinated. And we also encourage everybody to contact their GP, go to their farm. The pharmacists have been amazing. Can I thank the pharmacists? In a very short period of time, they've stood up and uh, are dishing out thousands of doses every week, especially in those local government areas of concern. So, um, you know, our challenge is reducing the case numbers, but importantly, keeping people out of hospital, uh, because once we get to that 80% double dose in November, uh, once the nation gets to that 80% uh, double dose, living with COVID will be very different to what some uh, states are experiencing today. Uh, living with COVID means uh, you have to um, obviously assume uh, that you're going to get a certain number of case numbers after 80%, so long as people stay out of hospital and people don't die. And our main aim is now keeping people out of hospital, reducing those case numbers, reducing those case numbers, reducing death and keeping people as safe as possible. But we do have an opportunity once we get to those 6 million jabs to look at what we can stand up in September and October in a safe way. Yeah. Uh, well, th the issue is we know what, what the experts advise us is uh, with children, children are more likely to get 
uh, the disease from adults. And so there's no doubt we need to tread very carefully given the last few weeks we've seen also around the world. It's very concerning when you look at some parts of the world where there's very low vaccination rates, you're seeing uh, high numbers of cases amongst children. So it's really important for us also to protect children that if we reduce the incidence of the virus throughout the community it prevents more children from getting from succumbing. But there's no doubt that back to school will be an enormous challenge for us in a safe way. And that's why the health experts education are working closely together to work out what is a safe way and what is a safe environment to get students back to school. Uh, and that's why um, a couple of weeks ago, I was very keen to make sure HSC students got the jab so that at least we know they can sit their exams safely, especially in those local government areas of concern. And to the previous question beforehand, any student who hasn't yet received the jab, uh, who's an HSC student in those local government areas of concern will still be afforded that opportunity. And any additional areas that come into that, um, the local government areas will also be added to the list of students that are able to receive the jab. Yeah. yeah, well, that's one of the considerations. We know that when the advantage of having high taste testing numbers is, is confidence that you're capturing all the positive cases that are out there. The one downside is it does put pressure on the, the, how long it takes to get the test results. And in some regional communities, it's taking longer than what it, what, what it should take. So the health experts are working with the labs on that to try and get a, a quicker turn, turnaround time. And we just ask people for their patience. I understand it's taking up to two or three days in some communities. I haven't heard about the length of time that you've described, but certainly um, we want to make sure that people have the results uh, as soon as they do. But in the meantime, people should be staying home because the stay at home orders mean stay at home. Once you're tested, stay at home. Don't leave until you get that result. I know it's frustrating, but I'd much rather have two or three people, two or three days of frustration than people going out and and uh, and spreading uh, the virus uh, throughout their community. I'll come back to you in a second. Yeah. There was a report this morning that Cabinet is considering approving a thousand pokies for staff. Now those pokie licences, many of them will be bought from small clubs or even pubs that are struggling during COVID and just desperate for the money. Is that fair that those clubs would suffer for the staff? Oh, I'm not sure what we're doing on that. Oh, that's the first I've heard of it Probably about today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't don't always believe what you read. Yeah. Right, the Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Queensland Premier this morning is demanding that you provide a clear path for containment from COVID considering the case numbers are, are continuing to rise. Can you describe what sort of pressure the other Premiers are putting on you now considering the outbreak continues to get worse? Uh, look, uh, I probably felt the same pressure I felt with them uh, during the last 18 months. Um, I respect the National Cabinet process. I uh, appreciate every Premier has a view on, uh, on how things should be done. But I also appreciate uh, that New South Wales uh, has the largest population, the largest economy. Uh, and I think uh, as they want us to always sit up and listen to their specific circumstances, I think New South Wales uh, should be afforded the same. So uh, I look forward to those uh, national cabinet discussions. I think we need to have those healthy, robust discussions about the future. I think we need to be real about what Delta means and be real about what the future looks like and be real about how we can best protect our citizens. Yes, we're part of New South Wales, but we're also Australians. We're part of a nation and we have to accept what Delta means. We have to accept what the future looks like and be real about it and deal with it and have honest conversations with the public about it. And uh, that's what we've tried to do in New South Wales. We don't always get it right. We don't always um, predict things as, as the way w we think they're going to happen. But what we can say hand on heart is we're always upfront and direct. And as soon as we know anything, as soon as we have a new learning, we convey that. But I think it's, it's about being real about what Delta means. And it's not just an issue for New South Wales. When Dr Chant and I said again a few Fridays ago that this was a national health crisis, we meant it. Um, and, and I commend Victoria, they don't have as many cases, but they're still having to be in lockdown. Delta is here in Australia and we have to accept that. And whilst all of us would like to get down to zero as quickly as possible, we have to also be real to the challenges that involves. It is really, really difficult. Even when 99% 90, of people do the right thing with Delta, even having a handful do the wrong thing every day is chaos. 
and that's why uh, police will be increasing their compliance efforts. That's why we're making sure we're not leaving any stone unturned. But I also feel, if I can be so direct, that our nation has to come to grips with what Delta means. We need to look around the world as to what's happened uh, and be real about it and make sure we have everything we have in our power to reduce the spread, keep people out of hospital, keep them safe and give everyone the chance to come forward and get vaccinated. Sorry, there was another question. I'm sorry, I didn't get the first bit of the question. Oh, look, as I said, um, once we have six million jabs uh, in the community, we will have options before us. And well, I have, well, I have asked, uh, I have asked the health team to provide government with advice to if there are certain class of workers, if there are certain classes of, of, of citizens that are completely vaccinated, what opportunities can that afford? And for example, with construction, that's a good example of how we are allowing people back on work sites so long as they're vaccinated from those eight local government areas. And the rules within those local government areas are there, but they're a bit different to what's in other local government areas. So there's opportunities for us to consider what is a safe way to look at an activity in September or October, which people currently can't do, which won't impact on the case numbers, but we will allow our citizens to have that extra bit of incentive and freedom that they don't have now. And I think that's reasonable. There are lots of things, and I want to make this clear, there are plenty of things you can't do in New South Wales that you could do during the lockdown in Melbourne, for example. Uh, I'm going back to last year. There are certain classes of things you can't do now. None of us have been able to do for nearly two months that you were able to do in Victoria. So we're looking at those, how, how can we safely bring something back, um, given we'll have six million jabs, and given, I'm hoping in the next few days, we'll get to at least 50% first jabs in New South Wales across the board, which is a very positive sign. And I can't say enough how important it is. And I know if you've had challenges with the booking system and there's constraints, um, please don't give up. Please do keep coming forward and getting vaccinated. Um, we know that is the way for us to provide that opportunity for greater freedom to living with Delta into the future. But we also have to keep it real. We also have to uh, realise what it means if you're fully vaccinated, uh, and uh, you're keeping your family safe and yourself safe. When we get to 80% double doses for adults, there'll still be a category of adults who choose not to be vaccinated. And they're the conversations we need to have as a nation about what living with Delta means. And that's what the Doherty report talks about. But obviously we are in a stronger, stronger position, the lower the case numbers are by the time we get to that point. So please know that it's always our intention to get the case numbers down as much as possible. And that we have to do that. Uh, that was supposed to be the last question. Oh, they don't want to do that because they, they want us to do that, which we're happy to do. But please know that um, Service New South Wales has done an incredible job clearing a lot of the backlog. In fact, uh, I received an update to say the vast majority of the backlog has been will be completed by the end of today, I said next week. Uh, please know they've done an amazing job getting thousands and thousands of applications out the door every day. Um, and Minister Dominello will be giving an update next week to make sure that everybody is clear on what the wait times are, how we can process applications and Certainly, it's one area of stress we want to take away from the community. Last question. Yeah. Oh, well, look, as I said yesterday, the Commissioner will bring back his recommendations about additional measures this afternoon to crisis cabinet. But um, yeah, police are out there day in and day out in hundreds and thousands um, enforcing health orders. What's frustrating for us is that small minority who are knowingly breaching those orders. You know, and the two examples that I, I mentioned this morning, um, we will be alleging that 
in both of those circumstances, those involved knew exactly what they were doing. They knew that they were in breach of those health orders. So, you know, what we need is 100% you know, compliance across the board with uh, the community members. Not 90%, not 95%, but 100% of people complying with public health orders. Do you need to like Sorry, just. Well, at the end of the day, we would, you know, any additional uh, measures that would help us enforce the health orders would be welcome. You know, um, police are, are frustrated at the moment with that small minority that are out there who are breaching those health orders, and you know, we appeal in day in and day out. You know, either Deputy Commissioner Warboys, myself, or the Commissioner stand here and ask for people to comply with those orders. That's what we need. It'd be a great day if we didn't have to issue infringement notices, but um, we, as I said, we need 100% of the community to comply in order to reach that. So, you thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, look, again, again, that'll be subject to um, discussion this afternoon. Again, that'll be subject of comment um, after crisis cabinet this afternoon. So thank you very much. Cheers.